episode. Uh, today is basically going to be the payoff of everything we've done so far over the past few classes. And what that means is basically everything we've done so far is going to build towards what we are doing right now, uh, which means basically we are going to talk today about what does a scientific theory of how works that is in line with common sense psychology actually look like. And our final payoff is going to hopefully show that we can make sense of the idea of common sense psychology in a way that keeps the essence of it, but also is a genuine uh, improvement or breakthrough compared to the things that came in the past. So it's not just like the Churchlands say, where we've made no progress. The argument is going to be that we have made some progress in the past hundred years with understanding how the mind works. And that's what we'll be talking today about. That's what we'll be talking about today. All right. So the basic idea that we're going to be talking about today is uh, this core idea that the mind, the mind is a computer analogy. So mind analogous or like a computer. So that's basically what today is going to uh, cover is what does it mean to say that the mind is like a computer? What are the implications for this? Uh, what, what exactly does this mean for science? And why is thinking of the mind like a computer a way of putting our understanding of the mind in a scientific framework that can actually be studied? So right off the bat, um, and there's no wrong answers to this, what are some of the implications you can think of off the bat, this is not anything in the reading, it's literally just a like creative creativity question. What are some of the implications you can think of if we say the mind is like a computer or even more simply, the mind is a computer? What are some of the facts that follow from that or what are some things that pop in your head if I say that? The mind is gonna processing information. Yeah, so you, it, the one thing is, as you just said, it's a matter of info processing. So what it means to think and process is just like a computer in that it's just processing. Another thing that is tied in with this uh, in the chat that we can do math. So another thing that we think is thinking or being a mind is equivalent to a computer that does math. But what are some of the other bigger picture things? If we say that the mind is like a computer, what are some other things that we are committing ourselves to or accepting is probably the case or could at least possibly be the case? Yeah, so one thing Lino says, it's purely physical, or at the very least, it grounds out in a physical understanding. And then we also have ideas of there's a matter of information storing. So if we think of the mind like a computer, that means we can think of the sense of memory in parallel to things like the hard drive of a computer. We can think about bringing things into uh, conscious awareness as equivalent to bringing something up into random access memory, making it active at that moment. So there's a lot of things we can, if we accept the computer metaphor, then a lot of the aspects of computers that we understand allow us to then ask new questions or approach the understanding of the mind in different ways. And then it also has these big picture things like the fact that if the mind is like a computer, then there's some sense in which uh, minds ultimately are grounded out in physical reality. There's not a soul, there's not anything like that. Another one is if a mind is like a computer, then we should, at least in theory, be able to give a complete characterization of how the mind works. Because think about a computer. With a computer, um, what rules does a computer follow? Well, whatever the programmer puts into it. So if you know, if you have the program laid out in front of you, you know exactly what a computer is capable of doing. So if a mind is like a computer, we should be able to say the exact same thing about the mind. We should be able to give a scientific characterization of how the mind works if the mind is like a computer. So that's the big picture stuff. Now, um, and those are like just an overview of some of the similarities between them. But what I want to do now is just talk about if you're going to get the computer analogy fully, it's worth pausing for a minute to actually talk about how computers are set up. Because if we're talking about it in that way, it's useful to also think of um, the human mind. Like if, if this is going to be our analogy, we can't really unpack it fully unless we understand how computers work. So some of you who are, you know, 
programmers or just knowledgeable on computers and interested, this is going to be boring and straightforward and obvious to you. But for those of you who aren't as computer savvy, this might be basically uh, a useful little reminder or a useful little teaching. So basically, how does the computer work? Well, um, there's a few different parts. And this is not describing like all the ins and outs of it. It's rather just describing it in like a big picture sort of way. So one thing that is always involved with, an, with a computer is an input. So what do I mean by an input here? What sorts of things are inputting into a computer system? Information. Information, but what sorts of physical apparatuses are involved in inputting this information? Uh, a motherboard. A CPU. motherboard? Um, but even more than that, let's go like full basic level. Uh, how do you interact with your computer? There's I'm an just... interface. Yeah, there's an interface and also things like keyboards, mice, um, cameras, anything that is putting information from the outside world into a computer. So I'm just gonna draw a mouse because that one's simple here. All right, so if you've got a mouse and you click on something, what then happens? Well, then what happens is information is processed inside the computer. So there's a few different, and this is the tough part about computers, is describing it. There's a software level and a hardware level. So what do we mean by hardware? What is the hardware of a computer? Like the physical parts you can touch? Yeah, it's physical things that you can touch. So things like a computer, like the computer chip, the processor inside that is actually running the calculations, the hard drive, which is the thing that involves magnets to store pieces of information. The equivalent of this, the hard drive, in a com if we're thinking about a human like a computer, what is the equivalent of a hard drive or the hardware? What is the hardware of a human being? Brain. The brain, yeah. It's going to be the brain or nervous system. So in a human, that's what we're talking about. Now, what is software in a computer? What sorts of things are we talking about, Alan? Say the mind. Say that again? The mind in general? Yeah, so in a human, it would be the mind. But just so we're, we're on like a, a grounding level, what's, what do we mean by software? What is software? Conrad? So any, any programs on the computer? Yeah, it's the programs on the computer. And so if you were to actually look at it, this is basically, you can think of software, it's just lines of code. It's just lines and lines of code in a computer language. Now, this is why I have translation-ish. Basically, the way a computer works is there's multiple levels that are kind of this, multiple ways of describing processes that are the same but going on at the same time. So the way you can think about it is there's a level at the top, which is the programs and the software. And this is lines of code. And that line of code also underneath it is equivalent to layers in the hard drive. So when you see something written like A, B, C in a line of code, that corresponds to certain electrical connections going on in the hard drive. So the software is just a matter of lines of code that are being, you know, they are what the programs are and allow you to do things with your computer. Now, when the computer finishes running, it outputs something. And so what it outputs is any number of things. If it's a computer that's hooked up to a manufacturing system, the output is going to be moving the arms of the manufacturing. If it's a, a what, like a personal computer like you all, the outputs are going to be, you know, beeps or things showing up on the screen and all that sort of stuff. And now once an output comes, the thing about the output is once the output is there, it tends to lead to new inputs. So in a computer, if you input a certain sentence such that it ends up, you press some keys, those keys cause the software to make certain things appear on your screen. Once things appear on the screen, then that through the complex thing of you leads to new things being typed. So that's just the basic idea of how like the computer system works. And um, Alan, was it you? I think it was you who was saying in the idea of the mind as a computer, the idea is that mind and thinking is equivalent to the software of a computer. And so when we're thinking about the mind as a computer, what that basically means is to think is to run a software program. And so 
approaching things from like this computer level, again, this is a, this is a matter of like analogies and things like that. I don't necessarily literally think we should think of it in terms of software, but it's a very useful metaphor. Um, and now what I want to do is just dive in more of what it means to think that the com to think is to run a software program or to engage in human thought and go about everyday life is just to have software running and they are one and the same thing. So um, everyone on board with just the general picture of the mind and how it works, or I mean the computer system and how it works. All right, awesome. Um, so let's just talk about software and talk about why software works. So what is software? As I said, it's lines of code, but what is lines of code? Um, yeah, it, Nancy, did you just say letters? I can't remember if this was up here. So yeah. Yeah, I did. Okay, awesome. So yeah, lines of code are just letters. So, um, you know, I don't speak any co code very well, so I'm not gonna put up something that's actually here, but if you actually look at a line of code, it'll just be things like, X, Y, open paren, three, two, two, close paren, eval, blah, 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 blah. It just looks like this, letters, numbers, etc. So what is it that a software program is actually doing? What is it actually doing in the background? Well, all it's really doing, what a software program is, is just a set of instructions for turning some letters into other letters. So a, a very simple software program would be something like this. Um, if a number, then add one, then the input could be something like one. And if you apply, combine this rule with this number, you just get two. So that's all it is. Or it could be something like this. Um, if you have uh, this symbol, then produce this symbol. That is also just what software is. It's just these rules. So then if a software program were then inputted something like this, it would just produce something like that. And so here's where, um, like at the end of the day, all software is, is changing symbols around. It's a lot of if then statements. So things like if this symbol, then produce this symbol. Um, or things like if this and this produce this and this produce this. If just this produce that. So that's all software is when you look at it. Now, this is where the genius of software comes from, is by itself, if you just look at what's going on in a software system, does the software system have any idea what it's doing? Is a computer system aware of things inside of it? When, you're, when your processor is running programs, is your processor in some sense conscious or aware of what it's doing? No. No. All it does is just move symbols around. All it does is just knows that if you get a triangle, spit out a circle. If you get a triangle, or if you get a triangle and a square, spit out a circle. If you just get a, a triangle, produce a, a T. So basically all that a processor needs to do is be able to turn symbols into other symbols. So the thing about a processor is, are computers smart? That's like a general question. Do we think of computers as smart? Are they intelligent things? Well, it's like a yes and no answer. On the one hand, computers do incredibly complicated things. Like the number of things that computers can do is incredibly sophisticated. But if you actually look at like inside a computer at lines of code, it's incredibly dumb. All a computer is able to do is to take rules that are stored inside of it and respond to those rules when given inputs. So for instance, if here's gonna be a simple sort of computer program, it's if A is input make or 
produce B. If C is input, produce D. So that's what it would be. So here's a question. If you were this computer program and this were inputted to you, what would you do? Produce B. Yeah, you get B. All that would happen is B gets produced. So this right now is just talking about things in a very low level, dumb way. Now, why are computers powerful? What is the value of them? Because at the end of the day, all they do is move symbols around. But where's the genius of it? What is it about a program that runs this that makes it valuable? Why is it that there are computers that do this, that make it more than just symbol manipulation? Or at the very least, it's symbol manipulation that does more for us. So it can perform computations with large data sets. But why is it valuable to be able to conf uh, perform computations with large data sets? What is it? Like, I could give a, a thing like 20 billion numbers, and all of them would have very specific rules. But what is it that's really valuable? What is it about a computer system that makes it Speed. important? Speed. But again, what is it about? Here's the question. Right now, I'm just giving you symbols. But what can this do? So here's another thing. Let, let's go into math. What is this right here that I just put on the board? An integer. I, so did I describe an integer to me? What is an integer? It is a set mathematical value on an imaginary number line. OK, so, so did I just put an imaginary number line on the board? No, it's assumed. It's there since the number is there. So then what is on this board then? Just the number two. So is the number two on this board? So like I took the number two. Where does the number two live? Because if I put it on the board right now, then I somehow took this mathematical object and stuck it on a board. What is actually on the board right now? Is it marker exactly? ink. Yeah, marker ink. And marker ink in a certain shape. That, as Conrad says, refers to, denotes, or represents something else out in the world. So it's not that this, this right here is just a symbol. We could just as easily have this as the number for two. It would be two plus two equals four, but we could just have it the case that this was our symbol for two instead of that. So the idea is that why are, is, are these rules useful? Well, it's because we can make these letters or these symbols stand for other things. So if A is input produce B, and if C is input produce D, nothing really matters by themselves. Like these are not useful, but you can imagine how if this is hooked up to the input in the right way and the output in the right way, this can now become meaningful. And because of that, a very dumb system is able to do things that are effectively rather smart looking and allow us to be in, do creative, intelligent things, even though the operating system that is doing this is itself very dumb and just changes pictures around. So to give an example, um, how many of you have ever tried to get onto a website? Uh, very often it's like a video game or alcohol ordering or something like that. And it says, are you old enough to do this? And you have to click the little box that says like, yes, I'm over 21 or no, I'm not over 21. How many of us have had this experience? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, we've basically all done it. Well, this right here is a perfect description of a program running to allow you through to the website or not. Basically what you do is the system itself is just speaking in terms of if A output B, if C output D. But what you can do is have this set up so that what A corresponds to, it's the symbol for a certain input, namely when a mouse clicks in a certain place on a screen. So what it actually corresponds to is the point on the screen next to an image that looks something like this. And then B is an output of access page or more accurately some other code 
C here is just no, which denies and takes to thank, but no thanks page. So here's the basic idea behind what a computer is able to do and why it's able to do such large computations is from the inside, all a computer is doing is moving symbols around. However, these symbols can be made through the nature of the input output system to correspond to things out in the real world, be it an image that looks something like this, be it moving a motorized robotic arm. So even if this is the only knowledge that a computer has or the only thing it's capable of doing from the inside, from the outside, it is able to do things that like process large amounts of information. It is able to make a robotic arm move when really all that's happening from the inside is just these rules. So what is it in the case of a computer that makes these rules smart? What is it that makes them about things? What is it that ties them to certain inputs and outputs? A better question is who is responsible for that? The, whoever's writing the code. Yeah, the programmer is also going to say what these correspondences are. And these are what are called in the um, in programming stuff. This is the semantics. The semantics is how your symbols correspond to things in the world. And then the rules for manipulating them around is just called the syntax. And so the syntactic rules of a computer programming language just tell you what things you're allowed to do, what thing, what symbols can be turned into other symbols, and what symbols have to be turned into other symbols given certain contexts. Other times, um, and then there's going to be another set of rules that the programmer decides that would then tie the actual uh, symbols that are being manipulated to something out in the real world. So what this is able to do is make something with no understanding, dumb, running on a chip designed by somebody, and make it do something intelligent by tying those meaningless symbols to things out in the world, thereby giving them meaning. So does everyone understand just how this general picture works? And what the real breakthrough is, is like for many, many years, people did not understand how could thought be anything other than magical? Because at the end of the day, if you say there's like, what is a soul other than something that we cannot explain? And if a soul is responsible for thought, it's basically just saying, we have no idea how thought works. It's magic. That's all we're going to get. So what this is saying is, no, no, no. We can actually do things that look a lot like intelligence. Things like um, a computer can add one to any number a lot better and a lot faster than you ever can. A computer can calculate so many things faster than you and I ever can. It can find, um, it can comb through ginormous data sets so much faster than you and I ever can. And the reason why is, well, it's got these basic sets of rules that can just be applied over symbols. So it doesn't have to concern itself with the numbers. It doesn't have to think like, well, I've never thought of the number 2,984 before. Is that a number I have to think about? It just sees symbol, spit out other symbol. So that's the general idea with a computer and how computer systems work and how they do incredibly intelligent things through dumb mechanical processes. Everyone on board with just generally how this works. And to, as I said, some of you, this is going to be very, very boring and like no, no shit. But it's a very interesting, sophisticated breakthrough because of what it allows us to say about the mind. So if we say that a computer is like a mind, and specifically it's like software, then what are we saying about a human mind? What is it to think on this account? Well, what are some of the things, given what I just said about computers, that we can conclude about minds and specifically about uh, the way a mind works on the basis of what I just said about computers and computers being like minds. Uh, then we can replace uh, the human mind by the computer. Yeah, so one thing we're going to be able to do is maybe replace the human mind by the computer. And why can we do that? Well, if a human mind is like a software program, then the human mind is also going to be thought of in terms of lines of code and also rules for going 
from one line to the next. Also, it's going to mean what? Well, that the mind is going to have, like, what it is to think is there's going to have to be symbols similar to symbols in a computer program. So the way you should think of, if the, the analogy is correct, what it is to think is to have lines in a specialized code of thought running in your head such that these lines turn into other lines in certain circumstances, given certain um, inputs. So the idea would be, and you very often, the way people often talk about this, just to give it a fun term, Instead of talking about, there, there's no correct term because we don't know what code language would, but people often call it mentalese. Um, so if you see that in the reading, that's what it's talking about. Or also the language, whatever it is, it's a language of thought. And basically all this means is that like a computer language, thinking can be framed in terms of language and in terms of rules from getting from one line of code to the next and in terms of symbols that correspond to things in the world. But from the inside mind, all the, the like processing power of thinking is, is just changing one symbol into another symbol. It's just that those, in the same way that a computer system is hooked up to the input output of it, a human being, these symbols in the mind correspond to things out in the world or bodily movements or something like that. So is everyone on board with what exactly this entails? So all right. So let's go with an example. This is what this actually entails thinking. So what would it be to have the following thought? Um, I'm going to draw a picture. So here's what the picture is going to look like. In this picture, there is a man next to a church. That's all it is. Now think Think the thought, there's a man next to the church, or a man is next to a church, anything along those lines. Well, what would it be to have this thought? What is it to be aware of this idea or this state of affairs? Well, on this view, um, here's, here's what your mind looks like. And I'm using space when really what it would be is code-based in a software area. But So imagine that this is the mind, metaphorically speaking. Well, Inside the mind is going to be the following. Square, triangle, circle. And when you have this thought, it will then possibly lead to the following. Star. Uh, no, it would be. So inside your head is going to be this. Inside your head is just a bunch of symbols. Now, this is the thought, there's a man next to a church. Now, what makes it the thought that there's a man next to the church? Well, presumably, there's something through your eye or whatever else that links this man here. There's something that links this relationship here. And there's something that links this there. And so all it is to have a thought is to have a certain set of symbols in your head. And for those symbols to be in some sense about something in the world, in light of this connection through your input processing, whatever systems. And then what it is it, for this thought to cause another thought is just for there to be a rule that says, if this is your set of symbols, you're allowed to output this set of symbols. But in the same way, this symbol here is still through whatever input gonna correspond to a man. And this is gonna be defined differently as exists. So whatever we wanna say existing is, that's how you would, this symbol here corresponds to existing. So in this way, what we're able to do is say how a very dumb system of a sort that uh, doesn't have to be aware can follow rules and output new things and all of it can have meaning through its connection to the outside world. So 
This is, these things here are just thought contents. That's what it is to have a thought content. To believe that there's a man next to this church is to have a belief with this content here. And this content here just is to have a thought about this in light of your very nature as a human being. So the idea here is that simply by going with a computer metaphor, we're now able to give a, a picture of what it is to think in a way that you could give a perfect characterization of. You could characterize what it is to have one thought turn into another thought. What is it for to have the train of thought, um, there's a man next to a church, well, therefore somebody's next to a church, or there's a man next to a church, therefore a man exists, there's at least one man in the world. What's well, just for there to be rules programmed into your head so that allow you to do this sort of thing. Now I'm gonna erase this disastrous drawing, but um, it's getting very messy. But does everyone understand the general gist behind this of how it is we, we no longer have to think of thinking as a very mysterious sort of process. Instead, we can describe what it is to think in purely mechanical terms of the sort that you could give a characterization of in a science. So for instance, um, it's not just like when you actually learn what gravity is in a physics class, it's not like gravity. It's usually like you say a lot more and very often mathematically. So you say things like, you know, I can never remember what it is about like the laws of gravity and how much mass and how much space because once you get relativity involved, but this equals a bunch of math, math crap. So in the same way, thinking can now be described in terms of uh, mathematical, symbol manipulation. And in the same way that with, with gravity or in another science, you can give perfect characterizations and predictions about what sorts of, um, what sorts of, what gravity will be like on a new planet you've just discovered. Well, you can calculate that given what we know already. Well, the idea would be in the same way, if we know the rules of how the symbols are manipulated, we should be able to know what sorts of conclusions a person will be able to draw when they have a new symbol in their head. So if somebody's never encountered a dog before, they won't have the mental symbol for dog. But as soon as they interact with the dog, they get that mental symbol. And based on what other mathematical rules we know, we can now predict that they can do things like, well, if, uh, if anything that I see exists, then this dog exists. So does everyone understand how the, I, like basically in some ways this is very straightforward and simple. It's basically the idea is that all thinking is is symbol manipulation. It's logic, it's math. Thought is in some way math symbol manipulation. But on another hand, it's a very sophisticated idea because what it's able to do is say, here is what thinking is in a way that you could describe very straightforwardly. It is not mysterious. And not only that, we are doing it in terms of notions of mental content that are there in our everyday lives. It's not like we have to go into something like eliminative materialism to give a mathematical accurate characterization of how thinking goes. We can give it in terms of this symbol corresponds to this thing in the world. This symbol corresponds to this thing in the world. And because of the rules that are installed in your mind, these certain sorts of thoughts are possible and these ones are not. So does everyone understand just the general picture? I wanna pause because there are tons of questions that can come up at this point. And I just wanna see how we are all doing with um, how everyone sees the general picture looking. All right. So, um. I a question would be in order for our brains to process things, um, experience is a must. Like, so that is exactly. one question. I'm gonna write down here and say um, questions that start, start to ask. So one thing I wanna highlight here, I'm actually, Nancy, thank you for asking that question. So basically another reason why this is such a breakthrough, because remember if we go back to, um, if we go back to Churchlands, they were like folk psychology, no scientific breakthroughs ever. Uh, we're doing the same thing we were however many thousands of years ago. 
One of the things Fodor says is it, this is in some sense a breakthrough and it's a breakthrough because it allows us to actually clarify other questions to drive the science forward. And so now we can start to ask questions like if to think, um, to have a thought that there's a man next to a church is to have certain symbols. You can begin to ask questions like, where do the symbols come from? And you can begin to answer these things in, do you have to, for something to be a new symbol, give me a second, I think I just got blurry. Stop video, start video. So you can begin to ask questions like, well, if it's symbols, we can now say, where do these symbols come from? Do they have to come from experience or are some of them in some sense pre-installed in the mind? So maybe we have certain sorts of ideas that are just in there to begin with. And there's actually some good evidence in the psych literature that uh, there are certain sorts of things that we actually in some sense have an idea of before we're born. And they're just kind of there when we're born. They're almost like thought, they're instinct, they're kind of like instincts in that we're born with them, but they actually have thought content. So there's all these interesting studies on the fact that it seems that we come into the world with a notion of object because it seems like individual babies track the number of objects basically from the moment they're born. Um, so they've done these really cool studies with babies in which uh, the way the study would be set up is, can everyone see down here? Um, can everyone see the things on the, the desk? Yep. Okay, so basically the way the study works is if I were to, there's like a hidden hand here and some strings. So if I have an object here moving this way uh, and it disappears for a second and then reappears, then disappears and then reappears, you as an adult human being are just like, well, yeah, it was one exact thing moving across. There's just this one object moving. And so you might think, well, this is, that doesn't show anything. That's just like, you know, adults have a concept of objects. But what they found is if you go like, like if you show an adult something in which the it looks like the same marker passes and then just comes out this side without appearing the middle, we're all like, what the hell? That was a magic trick. Well, it turns out that babies do the same thing from a very early age. So if this ba this goes behind here and then comes out here without um, being seen in the middle, the baby freaks out. It's just like, what the hell? This is weird. But most interestingly, if I were to have this marker go behind here and then have a different colored marker come out, you'd just be like, well, there's been a replacement. That is just, you know, a different marker. Babies don't pick up on that things. If you have a rubber ducky go behind here and then a toy truck come out, the, the baby still freaks out like, oh my God, the, the magic, there was something, how did that thing in the middle? Because it doesn't process the properties of color and shape. It just registers one object went in, there was nothing and, a, and the one object went out, which is suggesting that for the baby, from the moment of birth, it's processing things just in terms of this notion of object. Um, it's not trying to cluster together everything else. So one thing you can ask is where do these symbols come from? Some people want to say that the first things we ever encounter, it all comes from experience. Others want to say, no, 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 there's, there's proof that we have these things in our head to begin with. But note that these sorts of questions only become things you can really ask about once you think about the mind in terms of having symbols and in terms of our common sense idea of thoughts being built up in the same sort of way that computer programs are. Um, what are some other things that we're now able to ask? What are some other sorts of questions we can now ask on the basis of the assumption that thoughts are a matter of symbols? Well, who put that symbols? Into say that us? again? Who put that symbols into us? Yes, yeah, so that's another thing is how do they get there? So if there are symbols that we begin with, like a baby with an object symbol, the question becomes, how do they get there? Another thing would be, uh, what rules are we born with? And also for how did they get there? So for instance, um, what is it 
if I tell you um, I have a dog, you can automatically conclude, therefore I have like, if I say, or say John owns a dog, you now can conclude what about John? Well, amongst other things that he owns something. You're guaranteed if, if you were asked like, would you, if you know John owns a dog, would you bet that he owns something? You'd be like, yes, I put every pe penny I've ever earned in my entire life on that because it just like logically follows from the other thing. The idea then is, well, here's a rule that we seem to follow in our head. What other rules do we follow? Are these rules things that are automatically followed or are they just things that are usually followed? And tied in with this, how did those rules get there? And so just as like a little side note, anyone have any idea as to why it would be that we'd have certain mental, according to this view, why would it be that we have certain mental rules built into our minds? Speed. Speed, but where did they come? Like, what is the process survival. by which, say that again, Grace? Survival. Yeah, it would have been survival and evolution related. So the idea would be like, why is it that if you, so one idea that uh, scientists have had is that certain animals are programmed to freak the fuck out if they see something on the ground that's in this shape. And a classic example of this is those cat videos with cucumbers. How many of you have seen these videos? Like you, you I, I recommend watching it sometime. Just it's videos of people putting a cucumber behind a pet cat. The cat turns around, sees the cucumber and leaps about three feet into the air. And you might wonder like, why on earth is something, a cat doing this? Well, why, anyone have any hypotheses as to why they think this is the case? They think it's a predator. They think it's a predator, and specifically what type snake. of predator? A hey. snake. Yeah, it's the idea is that this, older cats didn't have this built in. They, the, the, cat, the domesticated cat is evolved. Basically what happened was a bunch of people a long time ago took these cats that lived out in at the African wilds. So they evolved originally in Africa. And they were like, if you actually look up like the African wild cat, it just looks like a house cat out in like the savannah. And so what they found is uh, the idea would be that, well, if you are programmed to automatically treat anything that's cylindrical on the ground as a snake, you're more likely to have babies and survive. So somebody who mutated to automatically freak out whenever there was a cylinder in the ground was more likely to jump. So the rule cyl cylinder input cylindrical shape output leap up in the air that ended up being selected for and evolutionarily we now have an explanation for why is it that cats freak out or things like human beings um why is it that it's very easy to remember certain types of things and very hard to remember other types of things well we can begin to give explanations in terms of evolution and how certain sorts of rules got in our heads or why are we really good at certain types of logical puzzles and really bad at other ones? So um, there are many, many cases we can talk about in which like the, the sorts of obvious truths that human beings seem to follow uh, or the things that like you get taught in a logic class, like this is correct, this is always true. Human beings are really bad at some of them. Um, and why is that the case? Well, we can begin to ask ourselves, well, how did this come about? And if we think about it in terms of symbols being the grounding, we now have like a mechanical explanation for how this came to be. We came to have certain rules in our head that tell us how to move symbols around. Um, so does everyone understand just generally, like in some sense, this is really straightforward, but in another sense, it's really sophisticated and it's kind of wonky to say, all it is to think is to run a computer program in your head or a thought program. You, to have a thought is to run a thought program. Uh, and to learn how to do something new is just to have a new rule installed in your mind computer. Um, and so on the one hand, it's very like a, a kind of a crazy out left, left field idea. But on the other hand, it gives you all this power and all this understanding for how a mind works. And you can begin to study it in a very scientific way. So we all, this is generally the idea behind, and this is what is going to be called um, well, there are a few different names for it, but this is basically the, the idea of how a mind works. It's the core of most psychology today, which is either a computational, computational or representational theory of mind. 
And this is the idea that what it is to have a mind is to have a computational system that deals with representational symbols. And if all this is right, then we can begin to ask questions. This is the, really the grounding for why psychology can be a science. Um, now, uh, any other things people want to bring up? Questions, comments, concerns, boredoms, anything? No, I just want to say that this makes me think of my developmental psychology course mm -hmm. and teaching how children, how we learn as growing babies. And like, I remember the one example, like if a, a baby, well, a toddler, whatever we want to say, once they become aware and they see a dog, they know it's a dog, but then maybe they see a cat and they'll call the cat a dog as well because they don't have a symbol in their brain for that yet. And exactly, this is another way it gives, one of the powers of this theory is it is able to fit in so well with so much data we have. So we can say something like, well, when a child is first born, they don't have many symbols. They have to create new symbols and they only create new symbols when they absolutely have to or are told it doesn't work for this other thing. And so you can think about thought, like give a nice computational account of why it would be the case that it's calling a cat a dog. Well, it, the input is relatively similar enough because if you actually pause and think about it, like your average cat looks a lot more like certain species of dogs than some dogs look like other dogs. Like if you look at like a Great Dane and a pug, it's like, what the hell are these things have in common? And you look at a pug and a cat and you're like, it, well, they're about the same size. So you can see why this would be the case and why if uh, the symbols are in this way, that's why you would overcompensate as a child. Um, so everyone on board with basically, and this is just to explain how thought contents work and how we can get from one content to another and why it's the case that if you have one content in your head, you're more or less automatically gonna be able to think of a different content. If you have a thought, there's a dog, you have a content, you can immediately think there's a dog or there's a cat because one of them's true. All right, um, so uh, the next thing I wanna highlight is actually, so. Basically, this captures, this idea captures one of the things we talked about last time of what Fodor said any good theory of the mind that is built on folk psychology uh, needs to do. It needs to explain three different things. And one of the things we said, it needs to explain causal power. And this does explain causal power. A computational theory of mind explains the causal power of the mind. Why is it that one thought leads to another thought? Well, it's because the thought, all it is to think is to have a string of symbols in your head. And all it, because symbols are manipulated in accordance with rules, to go from one thought to another is just for the rules that are in there to be performed. So if you've got a rule in your head that says you can turn this symbol into this symbol, then it's very easy to, like you have built into your ideas, why you're able to go from one thought to the next thought. It also explains why it is that a thought can cause something to interact with the world. Because if the, if the uh, contents of the thought, this representation are hooked up to the world in some sense through a perceptual system, you can now think like if you have the thought, there's a dog and the thought, I like petting dogs, then these two together, will allow you to interact with that dog and cause you to do it. And you can give a computational mechanical description of how this works. Also, it could explain why is it that like, you know, if you see a cucumber, you're automatically gonna have the thought cucumber. Well, why is that the case? Well, the nature of the, the symbol is hooked up in a certain way to cucumbers. Um, so that's the first thing. Now, the second thing I wanna talk about is there's actually a second layer to this theory. And this is the idea of, remember, what is a, um, an ordinary description of our common sense idea of something like, why did I, uh, why did he go to the church to try to vote today? Well, what would be a common sense explanation for why someone went to go vote today? Because he wanted to. He because wanted to, or he thought it was election day or anything like that. So what we see in that case, we're just going to go with um, believes it's bedtime. So uh, 
Fred believes it's bedtime. So what we were just talking about is the first thing, which is this part here, the content of the thought. And you can explain that in terms of symbols. And so what it is to have a thought with that content is to have the right symbols. But the second piece of turning a, uh, a common sense psychology into something that is scientific and testable is this bit, the believes bit. And what this theory of mind says is what it is to have a belief or desire or something like that is to stand in the correct relationship to that content. And now how do we understand what the believing relationship is or what is it to have a desire? Well, this is now going to be a different psychological study, which is itself going to probably be a matter of thinking about things in terms of uh, symbol manipulation and how those symbols hook up with what's going on in the world. So for instance, um, what you can say now is, as a matter of fact, generally, if you believe it's bedtime and you uh, believe your bed is right there and you uh, desire to sleep, it's generally going to be a matter of, uh, you know, these three things together are going to lead to a certain behavior, namely going to bed. And so the idea is you can think of what it is to have a belief is to, you have a content in your mind and that content is playing a certain role in the overall thinking process. So very often just as kind of a cutesy way of doing it and just to keep things simple, theorists, cognitive scientists will often say something like you've got the content it's bedtime in your belief box, where that's a stand in for whatever mental relationship corresponds with believing, where it's going to be something like treats as true and likely to be taken for granted in planning and all these different sorts of things. But if you understand it in this way, you also now have a nice understanding for why it seems you can have multiple different um, relationships to the same mental content. So you can believe it's uh, dinner. So imagine somebody rings the, the doorbell. A hey, ding dong. You can believe it's your dinner arriving. You can also desire it's your dinner. So what you could say is what is going on in this case? How do we explain the fact that it seems like believing and desiring can have the same content? Well, you say that the mind has the same symbols in both these cases. It's just they are in different functional parts of the head. So you can say this content is understood in all the same ways we just described. It's just we now also have these sorts of questions to be asked about like, what can you do with that? How do they relate to each other? And we can begin to ask questions like, if you have a belief and a desire, why do you not always act on it? If you believe it's dinner time and you desire to eat, you might not always go and eat. Why not? What's going to lead to this? What are the rules that the mind would have to run to explain these behaviors? Um, so this is the this is the second bit of the, how you turn the common sense psychology view of the mind into a computer metaphor view that is very is something with some real scientific substance that can be studied, can be modeled, can be looked at, and all the data that you study in a psychology class can really be taken and made to make sense in this sort of picture. So um, just to talk about the reading for, well, first off, let me pause for one sec. Are there any questions, comments, concerns, feelings right now? Question. Yes. So I feel like, so my question is, how is um, he tying it into kind of like a scientific theory now when I thought he's trying to stray away from a scientific theory because Folk psychology is the opposite. <laughs> so here's what, so um, that's actually a really great clarifying question. So the idea is supposed to be that it's not that we want to stray away from science. It's rather that we want to stray away from the belief that the only scientific thing we can do is neuroscience. He wants to say that, no, 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 we can give a, the because the mind is like a computer and you can do a science of computers, it is computer science, it's about symbol manipulation, rules, things like that. We can give that exact same sort of equally scientific explanation for the mind in terms of mental symbols, mental 
relations. And so if you're the, the eliminative materialist basically wanted to give you this dilemma, which was either science or yeah, one or the other folk psychology. So he's really what, trying to tie them in together rather than just lean towards just folk psychology. Yeah. And they're saying you can only have folk science because science, the only thing that equals science is eliminative materialism. Fodor saying that's not the case. You can have a science of folk psychology, or more accurately, you can have a science that begins with folk psychology and describes things in terms of beliefs and desires. Um, is this justification for behavioral science, asks Holland. Uh, it depends in some way. Well, what do you mean by behavioral science in this sense? Uh, because- we are studying neuroscience, neuroscience studies the, the neural connections, but behavioral science is kind of studying the outputs, the so, decisions that are made because of the processes that are taking place in the brain. So it's it would be a justification for a behavioral science in part, but also wanting to say, like it also wants to uh, capture those aspects of thought that are not directly tied into behaving. So an eliminative materialist is just looking, or neuroscientist is just looking at the neural connections. This is going to try to give an account of behaviors in this case but do it in terms of our common sense mentalistic studies. So it's trying to say that if we're gonna give these behavioral understandings, it's gonna be in these mentalist terms understood ultimately in terms of the software that a human mind is running. So in that sense, yes, definitely justifying behavioral science as something that can be a science, but it doesn't wanna describe it just in the purely behaviorist sense of only describing it in terms of inputs and outputs. It also wants to say what's going on in the head and giving a characterization of what's going on in the mind leading to those behaviors. So the, the way that um, folk psychology, it's supposed to be entirely, so the idea that's usually thought of is folk psychology in this sense is itself something that is going to be a science separate from eliminative materialism. Um, as a view. Now they are going to want to take, so there is still this problem of what do you do with all the neuroscience information? How do you understand that? And what the uh, folk psychological view or the representational theory of mind view wants to say is it's the same as the relationship between a software program and a hardware system. To understand facts about the software, you do not have to worry about the hardware. We can ignore it, we can skip it. Now, sometimes facts about the hardware are going to give you information about the software program and how the computations are working. So for instance, if a certain part of, or a certain processor on when a certain sort of calculation is working, then you know that you can learn something about what type of calculation is going on. So in this case, if, a neuroscientist finds that whenever you're solving math problems, there's a lot of activation at this point in the brain. And now you're asking, well, uh, when I'm calculating how to get to the store, am I doing complicated math or not? Well, what they can do is they look and see, well, when I'm going to the store, actually, the activation is over here. So that suggests the sorts of calculations involved in doing long division are not the same sorts of calculations as are being done in this case, but it can't tell you what those things are. So it's more like you can use the neuroscientific research to draw distinctions and learn things about maybe, because ultimately people want to say there's something about the soft, the hardware that is tied in with the software. So it's, it's, it's going to be in some cases treated as a totally separate amount of research, but you can still, while going about things in this representational theory of mind approach, draw on neuroscientific research. Um, but generally, if you actually talk to psychologists and you ask them like, why are you not studying the brains more? They're generally gonna say things like, the brain cannot answer the questions I want to ask. It cannot tell me what the rules are. All it can tell me is that probably is the case that this part of the, like if two different brain areas are activated, then it's probably different types of mental processing involved. It can't tell me what that processing is. Um, any other questions? I don't have a question, but I wanna say this makes me think of like the whole mind and body connection and how like the Western field really wanted to pull away from it and really mm -hmm. make it just like about science, about the brain. Like, like when we get sick, 
and let's just say when we get sick and we use medicine to just cover it up, it's actually a message from the body. Or say when we have anxiety about something, but we don't understand, it's the body sending a message and it could just be because something bad happened at that place before, or it's reminding us of something. So it's like that connection of those two, one can't be without the other. Yeah, and and this is and so one thing I want to highlight here is the the um I think that's a really good just just thing to lead into a highlighting, which is that there are still many sorts of questions that are gonna come up if you accept the representational theory of mind. And there's still a lot of mysteriousness. And one of them is how the hell do you run a soft what is basically a software program on a hunk of flesh that's in your head? And how is it that like we want to say that there are things like it's symbol manipulation, but how do you explain that and combine it with the fact that when your physical body is different, it affects your train of thought. So, you know, if you are sick, you very often will feel a little depressed and what it is to feel depressed, your thought process might shift and you might go in a more dark direction. How on earth could things about the body affect that? And so there are lots of questions in the background of how. And like, what is this? And the short answer is right now, um, nobody's really been able to come up with an account of how on earth we make the brain and like the software stuff interact. Because in a computer, they basically, you've got three levels of language. You've got the, like the coder language, the uh, processing, la the processor language, which is a bunch of ones and zeros. And then there's something in the middle that allows the two to interact with each other. But um, this is supposed to be arrows, but it's going disastrously. In a human mind, we still don't have any understanding of this bit. Um, but that's the general gist here is if you go with this approach and if you think about, so just to like paint the picture of how all these last three classes fit together, the idea is supposed to be that um, we want to make a science that begins with folk psychology and says that if we keep folks, the reason our folk psychological judgments are right so much of the time or useful so much of the time is because they're largely accurate. When I say someone has a belief that, that, that the sky is blue, that's not some false statement that is just shorthand for some sort of mental neuroscientific explanation. It's rather a, an accurate true statement about something that exists in the world, namely the human mind, which is just as real as any software program. And just like a software program, it's just a bunch of lines of human mind code, symbol manipulation. And so the idea is, well, if we think about it this way, we can now ask lots of interesting questions about how this processing system works. We can ask lots of interesting questions about what are these symbols like? How do we change them? Um, so, that's what uh, this is actually a nice little transition into our the little like what are we going to be talking about for the next two classes so before I transition and officially end class and just do the little 10 minute preview are there any more questions about this um just to highlight the general gist of like what I want everyone to take away is just generally why the idea that the mind is a computer is a powerful interesting idea that is kind of in the background of so much psych research. And when psychologists are doing the studying, they don't gen they generally just give the behavioral descriptions of like, if you put an individual in this case, then it does this. But in the background, like the philosophical underpinnings of this is this idea that the reason these things hold true is by and large because of facts about how the mind is running and facts about how environmental inputs affect the internal running of the mind. Um, are there any other things people want to stress here, questions, confusions, anything? If you did not understand all the details of this, do not stress about it. It's I want the big picture to be understood. If you got something out of the reason why the dumb system doing smart things is like a major breakthrough, awesome. If it wasn't so clear, that's okay as well. And good news is now that this background, like big picture background stuff is out of the way, we can now start asking some more like fundamental, interesting, smaller scope questions that I think are gonna be a bit easier to digest for here on out. I, I would say the hardest stuff of the semester is now behind us. So um, that's good news. Any other questions, comments, concerns?
All right. So the last things I want to say is uh, the readings for next few classes. Does anyone uh, who's looked at the syllabus, syllabus know what our next few classes are about? We can play hangman if you want. E. <laughs> J, no J. A, okay. Nope. S, this this is correct. I. I. Not an I. I keep they keep coming through so fast. L. L is also not. D. No D. D R. There was an R, an I, and a D. There's no vowels. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's one more vowel here that nobody has said yet. I don't think it's the one that looks like a bagel. There oh. we go. Yeah. And then there's a keyword or key letter. I'll give you a clue. It's the one that is in cat at the start. C. 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 Uh, I'm just gonna write it. Concepts. What we're going to be looking at for the next few classes, is what are concepts like and what is a concept and more specifically, how are they structured in the mind? Because this is a question that kind of gets to the core of how thinking works. So what do we mean by a concept? Well, a concept is generally the thing in the head that that symbol in the processing corresponds to. So the way we typically think of it is when you have a line of code in your head, like say A, B, C, this doesn't directly go to the world, it rather gets goes through a concept. And the concept is the thing in your mental memory, your storage, that corresponds to that thing out in the world. So when you see a cat and you go, oh, damn, that's a cat. You're, what you're doing is you're activating your concept of cat. And so what we're going to be looking at is what is this cat concept? And what there's going to be a few questions here. One of them is how the hell can you have a concept in your head that tells you that something out in the world is a thing of a certain type. So for instance, what, what is it to have a concept that's about cats? Another question is how is this, what can we say about the structure of the concept itself? What can we say about, like when I say I have a thought that cats are great, what exactly does that mean? Like how do I go about that thinking? And the, this has implications for what exactly is it to, to have the concept cat? And so one of the main, just to give a preview of the main idea that many people have thought of, is what a concept is, is basically a definition for something. So the reason, what is the concept cat? Well, you've got something stored in your memory, where this is stored, understood, memory being understood, understood in a software sort of way of its representational. And in here you have things like mammal, cute, eats mice, and all these sorts of things. And the idea is, well, when you're saying, when you're learning something for the first time, when you're learning what, that it's true, what you're doing is activating your concept and then adding more to the definition. And then if you're out in the world and you're trying to figure out, is that a cat or not? You look at its behaviors and try to see how this works. And now what is the payoff? Why should we care about how, uh, what concepts are, how they're structured and how they work? Well, concepts are basically the core of how human thinking of the conscious variety works and also things like um, a lot of our behaviors, the idea is that it's grounded in concepts. So take something like racist behavior. What is it that explains why some, one person is a racist and another person is not? Well, presumably it's got something to do with their concept of people of color. A racist is going to have negative ideas associated there. Somebody who's not racist is not going to have those negative ideas here. But understanding how this is structured and what the nature of it is, is going to determine how we would go about changing this person's behavior. If we think that the reason that this person has um, a racist belief is because in this person of color, they have bad. Well, then teaching this person how to change, like getting their views changed, means changing their concepts. 
and how the concept is built and what it's like is going to change our way of getting them to change their minds. And so what we're going to be looking at is different views of what concepts are, because in most, um, most things you're going to study in psychology classes are going to be tied in with this notion of a concept. So another thing is to go with Grace's um, discussion from before, uh, a dog and cat a child who sees a, a cat and calls it a dog, what you're going to want to say is the issue is they do not yet fully have the concept cat in their mind. Well, what would it be to learn a new concept? How does that work? How can we encourage people to learn new things? If you're interested in making sure your child is a little genius, what do you need to do to make sure they get new concepts in their head as early and as effectively as possible? Well, understanding the structure of concepts, what role they play in the mind is going to be better at understanding this. And just tying this back in, the reason that concepts and talking about concepts is something that makes sense and why it's a question that comes up is because of what we are talking about today. It's because we think that there are these symbols that tie up to concepts and that what thinking is, is acting on these symbols. Uh, that's why questions about concepts as parts of thought really come up. And we can begin to ask things like, how do those parts fit together? What rules do we use for combining them? All right, so next time uh, the reading is going to be looking at the definitional view of concepts, which is the oldest view. And it's basically the idea that what it is to think a, uh, something is a cat is, or what your concept of cat is, is like a definition of cats. Um, and then we're going to look at some of the issues that come up with that view. Uh, so any last questions on that? All right. Well, in that case, have a good weekend, everybody. I will see you next week. And as I said, things are going to get a little more meaty from here on out. So it should be easier to follow along with and less like big picture, like what is the point of this sort of stuff? All right. I'll see everyone next week. Have a good one. Um, Thank you.